So, thank you, everybody. My name is Marty Zaluski. I'm the state veterinarian for the state of Montana um, at the Department of Livestock that's been charged with kind of a, uh, the statutory authority for control um, and eradication of feral swine in the state of Montana, which um, there's been a lot of questions. I would hope that everybody in this room recognizes that those that, that we do not have feral swine established in the state. So these, what we're doing here is a preemptive, proactive effort to get the, the critical and necessary stakeholders together should we um, get intro an introduction down the road. Um, so it is certainly my privilege to kick off this important meeting. And I do want to acknowledge first and foremost the Montana Invasive Species Council um, that made this meeting possible um, you know, provided us a space, provided um, some food over lunch for the folks that have registered and um, has been critical in um, kind of the collaborative uh, push to get all kinds of stakeholders together um, for, uh, for a potential response and planning ahead of time. So the Department of Livestock started working on the feral swine issue in um, 2012 actually with Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Uh, we didn't quite have a, a, a bill or some language um, put together in time for the 2013 legislature, but then we submitted that as a department bill for the 2015 legislature and it didn't get passed. Um, I will give credit to the legislature for a couple really important um, changes to the, to the initial bill, maybe one in particular, and that is the cost of feral swine eradication can be really significant because of the amount of resources that, that's needed. One of the things the legislature um, added to this, to our bill, um, is the ability for us to uh, go into a general fund or be funded by general funds should the cost of eradication exceed $1,000. So um, it's, a, it's really important for us to make sure that we can you know, help protect the state but also have the resources to do it successfully. Um, so obviously we're aware of, of the significant impact that feral swine can cause, uh, whether it's to the environment, um, wildlife, and certainly livestock. Uh, the cost to the nation is in the billions of dollars. And if, in fact, uh, the, the species, those or those animals come, do come into Montana, um, it will take all of the folks that are sitting here in this room to, for, to have a collaborative process. And by that I mean, you know, obviously Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, in addition to the Department of Livestock staff, we, we, we will um, be highly um, in need of wildlife services um, efforts. Thanks, John, for being here. Obviously, um, NGOs, uh, Montana Wildlife Federations here, we appreciate their support, not only in passing the bill in 2015, but being engaged in the issue since then. Um, of course, I think I heard somebody from BLM here. Obviously, land ownership um, and land federal public land managers are going to be critical in, in any kind of effort. Um, and, and then, of course, um, and of course, uh, you know, Montana Invasive Species Council that kind of puts it all together. So I just want to, before I jump off the stage and let you guys uh, start with the content, um, I want to introduce just a couple folks. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Ms. Lila Taylor is here. She's a board member for the, from the Board of Livestock, so thank you for making it. Um, and then just folks, other folks from our department are here. Dr. Tani Schmansky in the back, Assistant State Veterinarian. Dr. Anna Forseth. Um, also, Travis Elings is here, and I would expect Clay Vines to be here as well, so outstanding. So thank you so much for being here, and I didn't even acknowledge, you know, we also have producer organizations here. The Montana Pork Producers um, Association is here too, so it really does take a village, and I'm really pleased um, to be able to, you know, kick, kick this meeting off for you and uh, go from there. All right, welcome. Thank you. <coughs> We know who's next. Yeah, we do. <laughs> no one's stepping up. I'll <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Ryan Brook from the University of Saskatchewan, and so for the last almost 10 years, uh, we've been doing research on wild pigs up in Canada. So. Today I get the joy of sharing a little insight into our research program and what we found so far. So I will jump 
right into that. And what I was asked to speak about this morning specifically is reproduction of wild pigs, because this is, of course, one of the factors that makes them so terrible. And so uh, the range and how they quickly expand is really quite phenomenal for many reasons, their mobility and lots of other factors. But certainly this extremely high reproductive rate is what we really, I think, are primarily challenged with. First of all, I want to recognize this is a huge team effort. In fact, the, the overwhelming majority of the funding for our research comes from Dale Nolte's program in the USDA. And so people ask, why is USDA funding work in Canada? Today, I think we'll have the answer for you. And I'll, I'll definitely recognize that Dale was smart in supporting that early on, because what's happening in Canada clearly creates some very important risks and concerns for what's going on down here. So I think our Canadian research is going to be of some, some interest. And so Ryan Powers here from USDA in North Dakota, he was fundamental to get this off the ground. He was involved in the early days. I think he's the airway, he's the guy with the beard. Everybody else is relatively clean shaven. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, Bob Brickley couldn't be here. Uh, he's away, but he was also instrumental. And so there's a group in southeastern Saskatchewan, a bunch of cattle producers working on their own time and their own dime, have for many years, long before I ever showed up and figured out what a wild pig was, they've been out on the ground trying to figure this out and killing pigs and removing pigs and figuring out as a team on the ground, how do you take out entire sounder groups and control pigs? And it's fair to say our program would have never got off the ground without them. They've been really, really supportive. SAS Pork funds us as well. Uh, in Saskatchewan, we do get some funding from the Fish and Wildlife Association. And we get some, certainly have had a lot of support from the University of Saskatchewan as well. So we've been uh, fairly well supported, but this talk today would be about two minutes long if it wasn't for the USDA. <laughs> Let's just put that in context and say that I'd show you a bunch of trail camera photos and then I'd go and sit down. So most of everything that you see in the scope of this is because of the support from, from those folks. So I can't tell you how grateful we are to get that off the ground. So what are we talking about today? We call them wild pigs. This is a broad category, includes actually a couple of different things that fit into the mix. Back in uh, the 1980s, there was a huge push across all of Agriculture Canada, all, all the ag lands, saying we need to diversify agriculture. And so we got into all these uh, get-rich-quick schemes like elk ranching, emu farming. We had a couple of reindeer farms. And one of those was a big push to produce wild boar. And so they were brought over from Europe and Asia to be raised inside a fence, mostly for meat production. But there have been and still are a few high-fence shoot operations as well. Uh, and unfortunately, these are the source. And what's happened is, over the years and even currently, uh, we have escapes. And unfortunately, there's quite a number of cases that are well documented where people have just cut the fence and let them go. Sometimes in the order of 100, 200, even 300 animals at once. And this was a thing of the past for sure, but it is also a thing of the present. It's still occurring. Uh, we pulled up to a wild boar farm in Alberta not that long ago. And all the piglets ran through the fence to greet us and say hello. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> these are the pigs that are kind of funny, and you go, wait a minute, that's not funny. <laughs> uh, so, so stop laughing. Uh, so a little bit of quick context here. This is what Canada looked like. These are big, large blocks, obviously, but this is from our census data. This is what it looked like in 2001, the ranching landscape across Canada. This was the peak. So we got into it in the 80s. There was a lot of growth and interest, but the market never really took off. Uh, there was, there's been some small niche markets, but not enough for an international sale. They're hard to raise, they're hard to keep inside a fence. And so a lot of people got out, and unfortunately, as I said, a lot of people just let them go and, and quit immediately. All provinces in Canada have raised them, and even actually the Yukon Territory, just off the north uh, west corner of that map, also has some uh, ranch right now. And in fact, they've had two escapes in the last two years that caused us some heartburn as well. So that's sort of where our source comes from. We really understand there's, you know, people have said, is there a chance they came up from the U.S.? Not really. We've done a pretty good job of seeding them all across Canada already, so we don't need any help. I think it's sort of the take home. And so this is what a group call, we often call this a sounder group, uh, which is typically a mature female lead, some other of her female offspring, and then Lots and lots of young. And that's what I really want to focus on this morning, is this reproductive cycle that is something that is really 
particularly notable about wild pigs, and you notice these pigs have these horizontal cream-colored stripes, the little ones, and that's uh, quite interesting, and it's useful in our research to help us discern them. Uh, sounders can get quite large. We've certainly noticed, not only has the population exploded in Canada, but we're also seeing very clear data that sounder size is going up, and that's certainly cause for concern. And obviously, again, the main driver behind that are these really high reproductive rates. So this is research from my PhD student, uh, Ruth Asham, who's just sort of wrapping up right now. She devoted, a, uh, well, five years of her life now to wild pigs. And uh, when we have a team meeting of all the researchers in Canada that study wild pigs, her and my master's student come and sit in my office. And the three of us have a little visit. And so we're a pretty small bunch. But this is a tremendous amount of work collecting all of the sightings across all of Canada and putting it together. Of course, the not so good news is the direction of that curve. In the early days, you saw a fairly flat line. That's what you hope and dream about, right? Staying around zero. But not that much after we got into the ranching business in Canada, we also got into the free-ranging wild pig business. And you see the scale there is on, uh, on the tens of thousands of square kilometers. So, you know, that's about 6,000, uh, 5 to 6,000 square miles. So big areas up to 80,000, so we're getting in the 60,000 square mile range, so the, or pardon me, uh, 600,000. And so the, as we're going up, we see that right around 2010, when I first started looking at this issue and I got my first job at the University of Saskatchewan, we were at a fairly low accumulation rate and populations weren't particularly large. Since then, it's expanded dramatically and we see this big curve. So what this tells us is that we have a very, very rapidly expanding population. And unfortunately, despite some efforts in Canada, which are notable, and I think we'll hear about today, uh, it's a losing battle. We're getting nowhere, right? The curve is going straight up. So there's no evidence that sport hunting has helped here. Sport hunting has occurred. <coughs> Certainly, at least since 2005, we've had extensive sport hunting. I would argue, and it would be fair to say that it's actually caused more problems than it's solved. So certainly any notion that you might have, anybody in the audience, that sport hunting is going to get you out of a wild pig issue, look at that curve. Sport hunters have been out very actively trying to kill pigs for a long time. And even despite the increase in population, we're not seeing a lot of growth. And the survival of our collared wild pigs, one of the concerns we had when we put out GPS satellite collars was that, oh boy, we're going to put all these collars out and do all this work, they're going to get shot in two weeks. That didn't happen. Some of them survived two years. Hunters talked a lot about getting animals and they were excited. There was a lot of talk, still is. But reality is hunter success is abysmal. They're so smart and so elusive, they're not getting there. So again, the take home message from this is that we're, we're on a massive increase and massive expansion. Now in terms of putting that on a map, what we did is, so this is the GPS collar locations for one animal. And so this screen is about 70 miles wide here we're talking about. And there's all the locations relative to watersheds. We used level nine watersheds and mapped them out. So all those lines are individual watersheds. And just to show you why, the, the average home range of these pigs is about the same size as a watershed. So we have collar data. We collected a whole bunch of interview data. Ruth traveled tens of thousands of miles across Canada interviewing people. We did a very large telephone survey across all of Canada. We talked to hunters and said, if you see wild pigs in your deer, your trail camera's looking for deer, send them to us. And we now have thousands of photos of wild pigs, including our own trail cameras, our callers, our own work, but also citizens have provided a tremendous amount of data and insight from what they're seeing. So when we put that all together, and this is just published, I think we have copies of that paper that were around. Somebody nodding. Nobody wants to make eye contact. I think we have, uh, I think we have uh, a stack of copies. I, in, in my genius, I made a whole bunch and then left them in my photocopier, but I think we might have some. So if we go way back to the period of 1990 to 2000, this is what it looked like. Uh, not, a, not a whole lot of reason to be too alarmed, right? We only have a few, but unfortunately, very much like a forest fire, very much like a forest fire, you could say, oh, uh, we only have a small forest fire, we're good. The only way to deal with this is to think of it like a fire. You call 911 and say, uh, my kitchen's on fire. They don't say, oh, your kitchen. Well, call me when it gets to the living room, and we'll get on it. 
that is not the thinking that we need to apply. Fire is perhaps the best analogy that I could think of. Having had some family members deal with cancer, I think the cancer analogy is also relevant. That again, just uh, you see a handful of pigs, you see this map in, in 1995 and say, well, Ryan, what are you worried about? Well, they are very much like a f wildfire and we'll see them spread pretty rapidly. So this is our first set of maps from all the data that we've gathered. And then now by, by the time I got what my parents would call my first real job, I spent an awful lot of time in school, finally started at University of Saskatchewan in 2010, already we see a lot of these watersheds that are occupied. We don't have good density data. People always ask how many pigs. We don't have good data on numbers of pigs, but we have very, very good data. I would argue of all the stuff we've done, this set of maps that Ruth has produced uh, is the best and most defensible and certainly most important data that we have to share. So I'm supposed to be talking about reproduction, but I'm talking about this because it definitely and obviously ties to reproduction. And so now, hold on to your hats, this is up to 2017. And so obviously we're seeing this very, very rapid expansion on the order of 40 to 50,000 square miles every year on average, and that number just keeps going up. So we're seeing a very rapid spread across the landscape. For those of you who don't know your geography as well, if we start on the far left, that's British Columbia, then Alberta, Saskatchewan is sort of the easiest one to draw, and then Manitoba right next to it. We do have some sightings in Ontario and Quebec, so there's definitely some populations there. Uh, BC has not seen much recently, and that seems to be our better news story. Uh, Ontario has started looking really hard, and they just recently, this year, found 25 new sightings. And so we're, we're quite worried about Ontario. We still think a lot about Quebec, but certainly those three central provinces, what we call the prairie provinces of Canada, that's where the overwhelming majority of the issue is. That's where we have a lot of egg production. That was where the wild boar were raised the most. And so that's where the by far the core of our problem is. I will also say right away that this is up to 2017, and so this map is already significantly out of date and has expanded dramatically. We have range, uh, at this estimate, at this time, we're thinking, we're, we're, not, we're, we're characterizing about 800,000 square kilometers. So that works out to something on the order of 600,000 square miles occupied by wild pigs. And again, that's, that's increasing at a very rapid rate. And so when we do our 2020 update map, coming up right away here, we anticipate a million square kilometers occupied by wild pigs in Canada. And so keep in mind that one of those watersheds, one's, one confirmed sighting turns it red. So it doesn't mean we're overwhelmed with them. But again, coming back to that reproductive rate, if you have one red sow, that's all you need. There is a little bit of a zoom in, and of course, uh, Montana being directly below. We don't have a lot of pigs either in Alberta or uh, Saskatchewan right on the boundary in this map, but since that map is produced, there have been quite a number of sightings already come in on the, on the Alberta side. Some were very close to the border, and we have quite a number coming in from uh, Saskatchewan as well. So uh, very soon we'll have an updated version of this, and unfortunately it's just more bad news. Uh, and, and this is exactly what we expect, right? None of this should be a surprise to anybody that knows anything about invasive species or certainly knows anything about wild pigs. These things uh, have a tremendous capacity to expand, and everywhere except Antarctica, they are spreading and, and causing lots of harm. And so this is exactly consistent with what I think the, everyone predicted in the beginning. The other thing I will note before I jump into some details on the reproduction is that most of the pigs that we have in Canada, what we call a wild pig, is a hybrid of some kind. When, uh, uh, when they brought in wild boar to be farmed, these are true wild boar from Europe and Asia, Russian wild boar, Polish wild boar from the UK, the experts said if you want to have high reproductive rates in big animals, crossbreed them with a domestic pig and you'll get a bigger animal. And so these are hybrids. Some of the pen and shoot operations claim to have true pure wild boar. Uh, we're looking at that right now to test it. I'm not thoroughly convinced, but they will look, you know, that animal on the left looks very characteristic of a Eurasian wild boar for sure, but almost certainly has at least some domestic pig in it. The reality of that, though, is it sort of turns into more of a, what we would often call a super pig because that hybridization makes them bigger, higher reproductive rates, and, and longer. In fact, a domestic pig has an extra rib, as some may know, and they're longer, 
And a lot of our wild pigs that we're collecting in the field have that extra root. So we know they're hybrids. We do have probably a, a handful of true wild boar running around the landscape. Those are hybridization in the wild. This is actually a pig farm in southeastern Saskatchewan. We did a double take, and I think uh, Pow Ryan Powers was driving, and he jammed on the brakes. So he said, look, what the heck? He said, what's a, just a herd of pigs. What are you talking about, outdoor operation? He said, no, what's in there with them? And sure enough, there's a wild pig that had moved in and taken up residence with these domestic pigs. And that spring, all the piglets had those horizontal cream-colored stripes. And I don't know the physics of how that worked with that little gaffer, but uh, he got it done anyways. <laughs> so uh, certainly one of the things I've already noted, and which is really important, is that not only are we seeing this massive expansion, but we're also seeing increase in uh, sounder size. So this is in central Saskatchewan. This was taken late summer of this year. And so again, any hope that we're seeing any sort of flattening or, or reduction in growth, I think has been crushed by some of these images that show, you could try and count there. I think I got about 28 in my best count from that image. And if you notice, and particularly alarming, there's lots and lots of little ones. And of course, that's what's, again, that's what's driving this increase. So when you, do, when you survey wildlife and you count lots of young ones, that's a pretty clear indicator you're on an upward trend. Because of this hybridization, we do see a hunter shot this animal, and people said, well, that's a domestic pig, got it. And he said, well, I was traveling with two that looked exactly like classic wild boar. So not only do we have wild boar, mostly most of the animals are hybrids of wild boar and domestic pig. We do also have some pure domestic pigs that have also established feral as well. They, don't, they almost certainly don't have any uh, wild boar genetics whatsoever. This is, this is a standard Yorkshire pig that you'd see in any barn, but it's outstanding in, in fields right now. And so we get a photo like this, which is a classic example here in, uh, in western Saskatchewan. <coughs> Two animals in the front, classic looking Eurasian wild boar. The animals on the right, that's a beautiful pink pig that could easily be indistinguishable in any pig barn in North America. And then you back, you see a spotted animal, which is certainly a hybrid of the two. And so lots of mixing going on. We do also have this massive growth of the pot belly pig industry. People sell these pot belly pigs. And, and people don't want a big pig, so they say, is it going to get big? They say, no, it's a teacup pig. <laughs> teacup sounds great. Oh, it's going to fit in my teacup. Well, this will be great for my daughter. She'll love it. And she does until the thing hits 250 pounds and craps on your sofa. <laughs> so there is unfortunately a, this massive, there are companies that are working full time rescuing these animals in their farms that are nothing but rescued pot -billy pigs. Unfortunately, people are turning them out to the wild. And in, you know, in some place in the US, uh, Spain has a huge issue with pot -billy pigs. The reality is these are all wild pigs. They're all the same species, Suscrofa and they can all reproduce. So this is quite a bit of a mixed bag of what we're seeing. The other outcome that we get from this hybridization is we see very large animals. And certainly 400 pounders are not that unusual now. Hunters are sort of slowly losing bragging rights over a 400 pound pig now. And we're seeing animals that are bigger. The largest we've handled in our program uh, was 638 pounds. And that was a sow. So they can be really big. Ask Ryan Powers about the one he saw that he claims to be 800 pounds. It might get a little bigger every time he tells it, but <laughs> he did see a massive one, which unfortunately we couldn't get permission to remove, but uh, we were sort of scrambling, thinking could we even fit a GPS collar around this thing. So there are some very large animals, and in large part I think that does reflect a lot of food resources in Saskatchewan, but also is based on genetics. So what's happening with reproduction? These are nests. This is an aerial shot looking straight down. Often in wetlands, they dig up the soil. In fact, underneath that dirt, you wouldn't know it, but in fact, there's 11 wild pigs all nestled under. We couldn't spot them with the plane. We couldn't move them with a helicopter. We couldn't spot them with a Ford looking in for a camera. But there they are. The only reason we knew is that one of them, the sow, had a GPS satellite collar on it. Otherwise, it looks relatively abandoned. And so these, these nests are where they uh, spend a lot of their time in winter. And there's a nest on the ground with a big pile of cattails. They will get into the snow and make what we call a pigloo and get underneath the snow. So people say, wow, they, certainly we heard this a lot. There's no way a wild pig is going to survive a Saskatchewan winter. You know, I remember a year where it was never warmer than minus 30 for 38 days straight. 
we get very cold winters. So certainly, on minus 40 is by no means unheard of. But underneath that snow, that insulation, they do just fine. And of course, they're built for it too. These big, large animals uh, are already pre-adapted to cold. But certainly, the snow makes an excellent insulator. And so there's us in our program uh, capturing wild pigs. And that's where we get a, a lot of our information from. Uh, you may not be able to discern in the photo, but there's an orange on the front of the front animal there is running. And we capture them with a net gun fired from a helicopter, put GPS satellite collars to track them. And then once we use those as Jewish pigs to go find not only the collared pigs, but anything else with them, and we can remove them, and we can get a lot of data. So we, some uh, uh, important part of our reproductive data comes from animals that we've recaptured. And what we don't uh, shoot from a helicopter. We have a little different, Canada's a little different in that regard. So far for pigs, that has not been a real consideration yet. But we have been approved through the university in my program to net them. We restrain them, and then we use a penetrating bolt gun to the head. And so it's very fast, very efficient. Small pigs, we can catch four or five in a, in a single net, and it works quite well. It's a lot slower and more expensive than shooting, but it's one of those things that we have to think about public perception and all that good stuff. Oh, I should, I should note, if anybody's interested in signing it, there is a petition going around to save the wild boar of Saskatchewan. Uh, it's got, I think, something like 24,000 signatures if you want to sign it and show your good support for these poor, invasive wild pigs of Saskatchewan. And so, you know, there are other perspectives. I respect those for sure. Uh, not in line with my perspective on this, obviously, but that is, there, there are different views of the world, so, so it is. So, to start our story on reproduction, when we removed these pigs, we, we killed 41 in uh, uh, spring of 2017 and brought them to a lab and working with the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative, they showed up with their mobile lab and they did necropsies on all of them, pulled samples, we took blood, all uh, we had a whole shopping list of things that we collected and one of those was we looked at the fetuses. I so apologize, this is not a good post-breakfast slide, but I think it's important to see what's inside these sows. And Certainly we do uh, a count of the number of fetuses in there as an important indicator and on average there's six of the pigs that we, we went through. We found an average of six. Certainly some hunters like Bob talk about 12 and 13 and some on an average, at least at the time we, we did that work, uh, that, was, that was the case. So a couple of take home points for sure. Uh, average pregnant wild pig is 73.8 kilograms. What is that? Oh man, I got to do the weights. I can't, I can't do my conversions to pounds. I should have done that. I apologize. Average of six fetuses per pregnant female. Large sows, of course, as we would expect, you get a bigger sow, an older sow, and one that has really good body condition that's been very well fed is going to have more young than a younger female that's skinny, which makes obvious sense. In our trail cameras, we have an average of six young at heel overall on average in the trail camera images but litter size is increasing significantly. And we're seeing litters improve. And you know, that may be partly a function of that sows are getting older. There's a lot of sows that live, you know, perhaps six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. There was one, uh, four years ago, three or four years ago, somebody called me from New York State and said, hey, we shot a wild pig in New York State. He's got an ear tag that says Melford, Saskatchewan. So, oh boy, this is going to be an interesting story. Well, we tracked it down through the Health of Animals uh, tag that it had. It was born and raised on a farm in Melford, Saskatchewan, right in the middle of the province. It was shipped to a game farm in the state of New York, uh, lived there for quite some time, and then eventually escaped and was in the wild for two, possibly three years before somebody shot it. And that thing, certainly based on the age that it left Melford, has to be at least 12 years old. <coughs> Now, keep in mind, most of its life it's in captivity, so it's, it's not, uh, you know, it's living the good life, as we might say, but certainly that gives you an indication that li these animals can live a long time. And then our, our, our collar data bear that out, that survival rates of females and survival rates of young are very, very high. We're not really seeing any predation. Uh, reproduction is continuous. So many of us think of elk, deer, moose, these sorts of things. They have a big pulse of young in the spring, and that's it. It would be almost unheard of, uh, although it happens very, very rarely that an elk calf is born in September or something like that, but survival rates are exceedingly low. With these pigs, every single season, we have trail camera photos of females with tiny piglets at heel. 
And so uh, they are reproducing continuously. Obviously, the three months, three weeks, three days it takes to go from being impregnated to having young. We don't really know how long weaning is. We have a whole long shopping list of questions we don't know the answer to. That's one of them. How long before they wean? But as soon as they wean, those men, and we, one thing you notice about our GPS satellite collared males is they're moving huge areas, you know, 150 square miles uh, is a summer home range for one of these animals. They have huge movement rates, which for reasons we're not entirely sure of, the home ranges are, are far bigger than anything else that's ever been documented in North America, or in the world, pardon me. All other studies show much, much smaller. Like one of my friends did a study in Europe and the home range there was like 2.3 square miles. And we come here and uh, females, the average uh, for females in the order of 100 plus square miles, right? So they're highly mobile and they're reproducing continuously and these males are sexually moving around the landscape, going from sounder to sounder, mating with any receptive females, moving on to the next sounder and just essentially continuously 365, trying to get enough food to survive and spending most of their time uh, searching out sounder groups. Recruitment rate is high. We really don't see mortality rates in adults other than sport hunting or control efforts. Uh, there's one case of, of one person that documented a wolf killing a pig, but outside of that, most of the area where we have pigs is on ag land, and we have a long history of shooting any predators that have been on there, and so we don't have bears or wolves over the large majority of that range. Uh, along the forest fringe, there, there are wolves and bears, but we see more pigs there than anywhere else in Canada. So there's no evidence of predation. Unfortunately, our predators are not going to bail us out of this one either. Um, the one thing we don't also have great data on is we know they reproduce, and then they have another litter. Uh, we do have some interesting evidence. So there we have a sow walk by our camera with a, you can see one piglet behind her. <coughs> These are her piglets that are obviously, uh, you know, six to seven months old. They've lost those horizontal stripes, but they're clearly much smaller than mum. This is just seconds. If you watch the timeline, this is only just a boom, boom, boom camera as they walk right by. And there, if you look close, you'll see wee little tiny piglets in there as well. And so that's clearly a sow, or clearly, almost certainly a sow, with two litters that have been born back to back, essentially. Yes? I was going to ask how many litters in a year can they have, so at least two. Yeah, they certainly have the capacity of almost three. It's probably not three. Um, we don't know. That's a really key question, and unfortunately, a lot of my answers today might be we don't know yet. Um, that is something we don't have a sense of. We, do, we have insights into the, how many young are coming out, but we don't understand uh, how frequent that is. And, and perhaps, uh, given the vast amount of resources in agricultural crops, no, again, we should not be surprised at high litter size and having uh, multiple litters per year. They can afford it. The energy's out there. They can go access ag crops and have lots to eat and produce uh, those young. So certainly that's what we know so far. Uh, but frequency, and one of the measures that we often look at one of the ideal measures that we want as biologists is what we call lifetime reproductive success. From the time that little piglet, assuming she's a female, is born to the day she dies, how many young does she produce and how many of those survive? Those are key measures. Uh, we don't have it. I don't even think anybody has those kind of data for wild pigs. There was a question in the back there. How long is gestation? Three months, three weeks, three days. Yep. Just like domestic, yeah. Uh, so this is a photo interesting just to show you the sort of the rate of growth. Unfortunately, we don't have weights on these. I would love to get trail cameras with some scales on them. But here's a set of photos that is clearly the same animals in a certain area coming to a bait site. And this is by a, a landowner up in that Melfort country in central Saskatchewan. He's been baiting them. He had only one group coming in. And there's that little tiny piglet shows up, the little wee striped guy. Uh, there's a couple, as you go through the images, uh, if you go through all of them, you see a couple of little tiny eyes glowing in the back. So there's a litter of piglets that are very, very small, clearly, you know, born within certainly weeks. Uh, and there they are coming back again. This is after 20 days. They've already obviously nice, round, healthy animals. This is summertime, so they're certainly visiting. Um, this is already into uh, mid-May, or we're getting towards mid-May, and so there are agricultural crops out there. There's lots of forage, there's dead deer, there's things to feed on, but there's also this supplement. And so the population is, or the, this particular group is growing pretty good. 38 days old, these piglets are getting pretty large. He shot the uh, adults, 
And so these are the young, and this is after 83 days. You can see the one on the left, we call them, sometimes refer to those big males as razorbacks. So you can see the razorback on that male on the left there. And these are obviously now fully sexually, or, uh, sexually mature animals work to get, traveling together, but certainly those males are going to disperse soon. And this is at 108 days, and then they were gone. They dispersed. And so over 100 days, that's how fast these animals turn from a wee piglet, they sleep in your hand, to this sort of what my, what my grandma would refer to as a big beastie, um, very large <laughs> animal, uh, obviously incredible growth rates. So reproduction plays a part of that. Genetics is a key part of this as well. When you breed in a domestic pig, you, you pull in all those genetics that have improved the, the productivity of the domestic pigs over the year. That's been the massive change we've seen in the number of young. My grandfather talks about when, when they had dom domestic pigs on the farm when he was a kid, there was just a big pile of straw that came out of the back of the thresher. The sow would disappear there in the fall sometime, just before Christmas. She'd come out in February or March with trailing two or three young behind, and that was you know, two or three was a good number. Now, uh, obviously, the litter size have gone way up in domestic pigs, and that plays a role in, in the reproduction as well as the expansion of these animals. I have a question. In following these, these pigs, did you let them just go out and disappear, or were you able to eradicate them before they... So that, uh, in terms of these ones, I only got the photos after the fact. Okay. So these, this is, these were not our cameras. This is just somebody we know. He's actually a really interesting character. He uses an alias when he emails us. Uh, he is literally off the grid. And what happened, well, the first year we collared, Powers and I had just finished putting out the first, no, it was the, pardon me, the second year of collaring, the first year in the northern study area. And I'm on this site, uh, Canadian uh, Wildlife Trail Cameras. And a photo pops up of a wild pig with a collar on it. I'm like, oh no, this thing is dead meat. I emailed him, <laughs> I emailed him quickly and said, please, like, it's great, post all you want. But if, just for the time being, while we're tracking these pigs, before we remove them to get our data, can you keep the location secret? He's like, don't worry. I am completely off the radar. Uh, he's got a, he uses his handle as a famous country singer, actually. But So we don't really know who he, Mr. X is. I, 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 uh, he did provide me with a wild pig roast at one point, but so I've met him, but I don't know anything really about him. It's quite a fascinating story. So, oops. Um, so that's our, our fairly short story about reproduction. Uh, I, in terms of time, I think we should have some time for some questions. Happy to take any comments or questions. Ryan, you might have to jump in and help too. Yes. You guys imported these pigs to game farms. Wouldn't the game farms be able to give you a lot of? information on the reproduction of them? Uh, they could if they would speak to me. Uh, my message is not one that supports, uh, you know, I, what I'm showing is leakage and, and essentially a, a total failure of that industry. I mean, it's, a, you know, it's been a total disaster. And unfortunately, it's been largely unregulated for so long that um, it's gone on for decades with no response. And so, there's, uh, there's a pen shoot operation in Saskatchewan and say, where can we go get wild free-ranging pigs? Well, go shoot outside of the fence of that operation because they escape. They could provide information. They don't have much to do with me. They've been very, very critical of my research and have attacked this pretty hard because it, it doesn't paint a great picture of the, that industry in terms of, I have no, you know, it's not my place to comment on high fence shoot operations, but in terms of when they're a major source of free-ranging wild pigs, then it is absolutely my purview to comment. And so um, my comments could easily be uh, con seen as being pretty critical, and I think fairly so. They have to, at some point, that industry has to own the, the pretty serious mistakes they've made. But no, they're, uh, <laughs> we're not on a, a first, we're not sending each other Christmas cards, unfortunately. But yeah, <laughs> one of the things that they have commented in, and this is an interesting thing that we have heard mostly on social media, they say, what is Ryan talking about? Six per litter, multiple litters per year. We're just not seeing that in our operations. Part of that may be because they at least claim to have Eurasian wild boars. So they say, we have Polish wild boar. And so certainly some of that difference might be explained by the hybridization, that most of the pigs free-ranging are hybrids with domestic pig, and these are at least ostensibly purebred pigs, which may have a lower reproductive rate. So yeah, they could, they should, they don't. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, when you showed the picture of the 108-day-old uh, sounder, yep. um, is, at what point did it become reproductive? Is, as far as at that point, are they eligible to uh, 
start conceiving. We don't know with great certainty about that. It varies a lot. It's somewhere between 4 to 10 or 11 months that we've read. We don't have good data in Canada on that, so it's a good question. It's almost certainly very much related to what they're eating, and they're getting good. I mean, Saskatchewan is providing lots and lots of great habitat, so we expect that time to reproductive is probably on the lower side of the spectrum, but that we don't know. But certainly, those animals are, yeah, you know, they're 100 days old. They're, if they're not reproductive yet, they will be soon enough. One indicator is that we expect, and again, we don't really know, but we expect it makes sense that uh, m males, once they become sexually mature, they're going to go out on their own. So the fact that they're still there may suggest not yet, but soon enough. Yes, sir. I was just wondering, uh, how, what's, what kind of migratory patterns do they have, the sounders, and at what point does a sounder break off and become a new sounder? Is that an issue, or do they just keep growing? If you could rephrase your question of something I have an answer to, that would be great. <laughs> uh, uh, again, unfortunately, I should just have a card that says we don't know because, again, there's so many things. We, we don't really understand sounder dynamics much at all. We do have the data to start looking at. It's something we need to look at. We have enough colored females and males to look at that dynamic. Uh, certainly, it's, I think we're quite confident that the young males are peeling off and going on on their own. There's going to be some mortality for sure. Again, most of that through hunting. Some, you know, they get hit on roads and highways and things a little bit. Uh, so mortality may play some role, but when they break off, I, we just don't understand those dynamics well at all. I, 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 I certainly don't. I can add a bit to that. I don't. I don't have the answer either, like Ryan. But uh, what we find in areas where hunting isn't as prevalent, we have larger sounders, so we're capturing larger groups of birds in those areas. Areas where it's primarily private land for hunting purposes, the sound is quite small there. Mm -hmm. So they get busted up pretty easy. And that's exactly, you know, unfortunately, sport hunting seems like this great opportunity. And my whole career, we've worked with hunters in all sorts of projects. They provide samples for disease testing. We say, you know, hey, we need a bunch of pig ears to look at genetics. And we get hundreds of pig ears. And so hunters are fantastic to collaborate with. And all kinds of wildlife stuff, they play a key role on the pig side. They can, you know, play some of those roles, but in terms of population control, there's just no evidence. And that's true, not just in Canada, but that's true in the U.S. and elsewhere, that there's just no sign that uh, sport hunting is going to fix your problem. And there's certainly some compelling evidence that it's going to make it a lot worse. I believe that one of our great problems that we have on that map with all the red is that sport hunting has actually helped to spread them around. They break up groups, they disperse animals. Um, when I met Ryan Powers the first time, he phoned me in 2013, I think we'll say. He said, Ryan, I'm not sure what's going on, but we just had some feral swine show up in the northwest corner of North Dakota. What's going on? And I said, well, we can't say for sure, because our, although we're, they should be, uh, none of our, that I'm aware of, none of our domestic wild boar have any tags or tattoos or anything, so we don't, no, we can't discern them readily from wild pigs, but not that long ago, in a matter of weeks, somebody let over 300 animals go in the southeast corner of Saskatchewan. And what happened was the locals said, okay, we're going to fix this, the do-it-yourselfers. And again, it's not, you know, it's not to criticize him, but at surface it makes sense, right? People that know how to shoot should be the, the source of the solution. It makes all kinds of intuitive sense. But what happens is they shoot them up, and inevitably, with you know 99% of the time, there's a sounder of 10, they shoot way less than 10, and whatever survives can be broken up into multiple groups, and they get scared and they can go for a run. You know, we saw one in Manitoba that went for a 25 mile run just straight west for, we don't know why, if it got shot at or whatever, but it just, they just go in these huge runs. Yes, sir. How ter territorial are the males? Territoriality, uh, the other point that I, I haven't made and is an important one also in the context of this is we see this very wide distribution. Overall densities are generally fairly low. And so we think probably that there's relatively little territoriality in Canada. There's certainly evidence of it. You'll be speaking to it next, I think. We've got our, our follow-up speaker, I think, will probably answer that better than I from the U.S. side of things. But uh, there's not a lot of evidence of territoriality that we've seen from our GPS satellite colored males. Whether that occurs at the sounder level is something we can infer, 
my dream right now is to get GPS collars with cameras in them so you can actually get photos and see what's going on and get some of those finer scale insights. But again, we, we just don't know. Yeah. Are, they, are they tough enough to put the run on the grizzly bears? Well, that's a, <laughs> boy, that's a cage match that I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't bet. Um, would want to be in the middle of it. <laughs> well, it, yeah, people have said, you know, are you worried about uh, a, a wolves, uh, a or will wolves kill them? I said, you know, in some ways, I think I worry a bit more about the wolves being impacted. These animals are huge, very large, razor sharp tusks, and they can be so aggressive, incredibly aggressive. I don't know, uh, I was just in Valmarie, Saskatchewan on a Thursday night, and they asked about what about our bison. They have a large herd of bison in Grasslands National Park just on the other side of the Montana border. And again, we don't know how these really big mammals are going to respond. I don't know. I think the concern is going to be more about the impacts of pigs eating grizzly habitat. And Nate, well, depending on your, I know there's some perhaps different views of grizzlies here in Montana from what I hear. But uh, from a, certainly we may expect negative impacts on habitat, probably more than anything. Yeah, I would suspect that uh, most large predators are going to see a sounder of a small, you know, a female with some young, they might grab a young one, um, but uh, larger sounders like we're seeing in some of these photos, I don't think anything is going to mess with the sounder of 28 animals. No. Sorry, do you have another no, question? No, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, very good. It was, it was suggested to me that if the dominant female is shot in a sounder, it can trigger hyper breathing, and it almost sounds like this division of the sounder could have that same effect. Have you seen any evidence of Losing a dominant female causing additional breeding. Uh, I this uh, boy. Uh, I'd like to talk about actual science and data. You guys are asking me to reach a bit here. The short answer is I have no bloody idea. The the longer answer is that uh, I can't imagine them being more reproductive than they already are. How would like how could they be more? You can't be more pregnant, right? Um, I, I think these you, you've seen trail cameras of sound of. With these sounder groups, it's not like, oh, look at that, baby piglets. It's like, oh, look at that, baby piglets every single time, right? I'm not sure that reproductive rates could increase from what we're seeing. That would be my sense from the data. But again, with, uh, with great apologies, <laughs> I don't have a lot of these answers. Yes? Um, color of the eye shine, and then also did Canada allow night hunting? Uh, Canada does not allow night, night hunting, and I doubt they will. It's a, it's a big issue in Canada for sure. The, the night shine, we definitely see them from the flash of our, when the trail cameras go off uh, in the night, we certainly get very good eye shine from them from the infrared emitters. In our trail cameras, we use what's called a, a non-invasive uh, flash, so it's not like a flash on a phone or a camera. It's a in completely invisible flash to animals. It fills the frame. The, in total darkness, we'll get a picture of a pig, but uh, it, the flash won't, you know, they won't go, oh, why'd you flash me in the face? Uh, but we do get high reflection from those eyes, yeah. Do you know what color it is? Uh, nope. Could someone please ask me a question? I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I would how, love it. Yes? How about human encounters? You're out in some of this rough ground trying to rebuild fence, stuff like that. Uh, most, for the most part, pigs are very elusive. This is one of the, uh, you know, I, I, I may come across as negative of hunting in the sense that I, I don't support it as a, or at least as the only control measure, but the one major, probably the most important outcome of sport hunting has been that it creates that culture of fear. And so these animals, we're not seeing lots of encounters. People are, we're seeing them. Uh, that said, they can be aggressive. A friend of mine last fall was whitetail hunting, shot a whitetail, put his gun on the truck and started gutting the deer and four pigs started running right at him. And he ran to his gun, shot three, uh, one took off into the bush. Probably just coming for the gut piles. They, they probably hear the gunshot and then they say, aha, food resource. Whether that's aggressive. Uh, most of the people on our team have had a holy shit situation or two, for sure. Uh, they can be. I had summer students, summer before last, just picking up dropped GPS satellite callers and a big male jumped up and ran right at them. Luckily, went right between them and kept going. So the likelihood of attack, I think, is quite low uh, until you start shooting at them, you start getting into their you know, riparian habitats and surprising them, that sort of thing. So uh, not a lot of, we haven't heard of any really major injuries and certainly not any deaths, but like any large mammal uh, that's very aggressive, certainly 
Uh, I carry my 12 gauge with slugs for sure. Absolutely. Uh, yes, sir. Has Saskatchewan or any of the other provinces altered their laws to try to address this? Uh, I, mean, I mean, have you cut off the flow of continued importation? No, yeah, importation hasn't happened in a long time. We don't need that. We have more pigs that we could deal with. You go to any farm and buy a bread sow. If you go, uh, you guys maybe don't have something called Kijiji, but Kijiji is a, sort of like your uh, Craigslist in Canada. And you go on Kijiji and you look and you want to buy a bread wild boar sow, buy one for two, three hundred bucks. And you could start your own operation, and, or you could. We're not that concerned. It doesn't seem like there's been a lot of cases of people taking them and throwing them into the wild. Again, we don't need to anymore. We've got all the pigs you want elsewhere. In terms of changing legislation, I'm not aware of a whole bunch. There's been some, uh, and, and Darby from Saskatchewan uh, government can speak to that later this afternoon, probably, certainly, but it's not my place to specifically speak about legislation. I know there's been some, some efforts to relax hunting restrictions to try and get more sport hunters on the land. Uh, but overall, uh, I'm not aware of a lot of changes, no. I think one more, one more question, and then we'll switch to our next panel. Right. Okay, take you. How are you monitoring the distribution maps that you presented earlier? Um, what does that monitoring look like for the data that feeds into the distribution? That's a great question, and I will speak to that specifically in the afternoon. We're going to talk about monitoring... Uh, we do have a paper that summarizes all of our methods. It's published in uh, uh, Nature Scientific Reports. I can send you the link. It's a free download. And we've evaluated methods from farmer interviews and hunter interviews to telephone survey, uh, trail uh, citizen science trail cameras, our trail cameras, GPS collars, monitoring uh, media, social media, um, and all of those methods combined have, have been part of that solution for sure. Yeah, so I, I will sort of close in saying that I, I think well, the case we've made, I've made today hopefully shows you that we're in a pretty serious situation in Canada. I don't think anybody can make the case against the science that the population is completely out of control. I th there's no possible, or at least as a scientist, I can't look at the data I presented today and pretend that this is anything but an explosion and a crisis. Um, some may have a different opinion, but as it turns out, nobody else has any other data to if people want to publish something or challenge our research, I welcome that. It happens all the time. But in terms of the information we presented, this is in a crisis. We're out of hand. And unfortunately, our big problem in Saskatchewan and across Canada is not just that they're exploding. It's also we're not doing a whole hell of a lot about it. And so that's really our take-home message. And certainly there are good efforts. And I'll never will you hear me criticizing anybody for killing pigs and for what they do. There's stuff going on for sure. And I'll celebrate that, congratulate that, support that every single day. But the data are clear. <laughs> and you try and tell me we're winning this fight in Canada, you know, get serious, really. Thank you.